Hello and welcome to the Billion Dollar Movie Club, the show where we break down and discuss the most popular films ever made, like Titanic or Return Transformers of the Age of Extinction. Yes, yes. I am your host, Christian Simpson, and with me as usual is my co-host, uh, Pawan Mehta. Hello, hello, Pawan. How are you doing today? Um, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. How about you? Uh, I have a fun hat on. I have a fun colored shirt on. That That is a mustard yellow shirt I'm seeing. Yeah, I got this like maybe a year ago and it's become one of my favorites hmm. because I have no other shirts like it. If you are an audio listener, I am wearing a mustard colored shirt. Pawan is wearing ketchup on their face. You know, I thought I'd try it out. You know, the red really helps highlight the skin, I hear. And to see that, you can follow us on YouTube at the Billion Dollar Movie Club and watch the video version of the podcast. But that's not necessary. You could enjoy it on Spotify, Apple, or Apple like Podcasts, wherever Google Podcasts. You hear, uh, podcasts. Just, you know what? Vibe however you want. And while we're on, we're on the topic of plugs, I'd like to throw out a plug that I've been meaning to do for the past three weeks. <laughs> And my genius brain just forgotten. Shout out to our friend Max Lissimacchio, who did the art that you're looking at if you're looking on your uh, podcast platform. You or follow- at our, uh, you know what, continue. <laughs> <laughs> at our, uh, like, image for our YouTube channel. That's the thing. Our thumbnail? Our YouTube channel thumbnail. Because we don't yes. use it for the individual episodes. Yes. So thank you for that, Max Lismachio. You can follow him on Instagram at Max underscore Lismachio underscore art. And that will be in the description of every uh, every service that you are using right now to view and or listen to our smooth, dulcet tones. Paul, what film are we discussing today? Uh, today we are discussing uh, Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End. Nope. <laughs> That's not right at all. And I don't know if you're, you notice you. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest is the film we're discussing today. That's the third one. I cannot tell if this is a bit or not. And I'm very worried. Should I be worried? Nah, nah, you good. Thank you, you good. Thank you. <laughs> You've just confused our audiences and we've lost 12 views. Because of that. Yeah, today we're talking about Dead Man's Chest. Yes. Parts of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. Released on July 7th, 2006, costing a, uh, with a budget of $225 million. Currently the most expensive film we've discussed on this podcast. Um, this is a uh, press release from the Walt Disney Company, September 9th, 2006. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest, the swashbuckling summer blockbuster from Walt Disney Pictures and Jerry Bruckheimer Films, added a new milestone, milestone on Friday, September 8th, 2006, when it officially crossed the $1 billion mark at the global box office and became only the third film in history to achieve this extraordinary feat. A number of the many records has crossed. It crossed the $1 billion mark in record time in nine weeks compared to Lord of the Rings is 10 weeks. At the highest grossing three-day opening weekend in box office history at the time, at $135.6 million. First film in box office history to pass $100 million in only two days. The opening day gross of $55.8 million is the high, was the highest single day gross in box office history. At the time, it was the third highest grossing film of all time and it was the first Disney film to cross the billion dollar mark. At its, the end of its run, it had a domestic total of $423 million and is the 27th highest grossing film domestically, worldwide, $1.066 billion. It sits at the 35th highest grossing film of all time worldwide. Pawan, what but- is your personal history with the film so before i get into that i just want to add uh you threw it out a lot of numbers just then yes a lot of numbers and for those joining in for the first time what we like to do on this podcast is we like to start with numbers and end with numbers 
<laughs> because not only is this a film podcast, it's a math podcast as well. Yes, it's important to learn. STEM STEM is very important in this time. STEM standing for statistics, um, triceratops, economy, movies, math. <laughs> Juan, what is your personal history with <laughs> either Dead Man's Chest or the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise as a whole? Uh, so I'm pretty sure I saw all these movies when they came out, but like, you know, I was probably like, uh, the first one came out in 03. Yes, 03, 06, 07. So I was five. Not much of the memory there. <laughs> I like that for Disney's first PG-13 film, you saw it in theaters as a five-year-old. Wait, wait, actually, okay, no, 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 I saw this. I definitely saw the second one in theaters. Okay, and the third one, the third one, which I mistook for this one. Uh, I think I, uh, my brother saw it like three times in theaters. Did you go with him each time? No, uh, one of the times uh, we were at our cousin's place. And I was really picky with my food. And they like sat down a plate and like, you can't get up until you're done with this plate. I literally sat there the entire evening staring at this plate of food while they went and watched the movie and came back. <laughs> Do you remember what the plate of food was? Uh, no. No, no. Now you mentioned the, uh, it seems like you've only seen the original trilogy. Have you seen four and five? No, no. no. So uh, I personally... Never seen a uh, Pirate of the Caribbean before this week. Mm -hmm. My only history with it, which I didn't realize till as I thought about it, was through video games as a child. Mm. Um, one of the last games the I Lego played, games. Well, one of the last games I played before my Wii broke was I rented the Lego Pirates of the Caribbean from Redbox. Um, I played it in Kingdom Hearts Two. I remember going to the world, but I don't remember any of the story. But I do remember playing that world. And then I was a big fan of this video game called Disney Infinity. Which came with these little figures, and one of the figures. Oh, that's that came a with Jack Sparrow. Mr. Jack Sparrow himself. Jack, can you hear me? Uh, oh no, I almost dropped stuff. What about the uh, the film director, the actors, uh, directed by Gore Verbinski? Uh, um, I very much enjoyed A Cure for Wellness. That's his most recent film. Yes. Yes, it was also a huge bomb. Yeah, I do remember that aspect. Um, I was shocked looking at Gore's uh, filmography in that he doesn't have that many post pirate movies. As much I mean, as I would he have. He doesn't seen. really need it. Sure. But like Michael Bay does a bunch of movies still, even though he doesn't have the Transformers movies. Hmm. Uh, going over Verbrinsky's uh, filmography Mouse Hunt in 1997, followed by a film called The Mexican, um, which. I think it's like Julia Roberts and Brad Pitt in a film called The Mexican. Damn, who's playing the Mexican? <laughs> One's playing the Mexi, the other's playing the can. Uh, he directed The Ring, which I had no clue. Hmm. Um, the Weatherman, the Nick Cage film. The Re oh, Weatherman. I saw that one too. Uh, it was. It definitely was a movie starring Nick Cage, but like not Nick, not like over the top nick cage he was a he was a very much subdued nick cage that's not a fun nick cage like i guess it probably could be good i mean they like... put him in the cage for that one whoa <laughs> god i wish that movie made a billion dollars so i could watch it um but since the pirates films all he's done are rango which he won an oscar for uh the lone ranger a cure for wellness those are the three films he's made since then. So I, I have no personal connection with uh, Gore Verbinski. Uh, I've enjoyed his work with these. I, I So I've never saw any of the films before this weekend. Which Only ones seen... did you see leading up to recording today? So I saw the first two. And I'll be honest, I'm kind of mad I didn't plan to watch the third one <laughs> before this because I actually liked these movies a lot more than I thought I would. But we'll get into that later on. Um, Giant Depp. Orlando Bloom, Kira Knightley. Any, any, anything you want to add about them? Yeah, Orlando Bloom during this period of like the mid to 
the mid 2000s he was killing it he was killing it he, well he was a huge heartthrob well he's also I, I, unless i'm wrong he's the first actor to appear in two movies in this podcast series yeah as as a uh, as Legolas in Lord of the Rings. Legolas. Legolas. I think I said La- I think I said Legolas the yes, entire episode did. last week. Oh wait. The- oh, okay. I I did not notice. <laughs> but as Legolas and now uh Will Turner. Um, Can we go into other comparisons to the other movies? Uh, I'd like to finish our history with the film first and then we can okay. start okay. going into the analysis section. Um so, any other history of Orlando Bloom? I've never seen any of his movies before this year, so I don't. Or Kira Knightley or Johnny Depp? Uh, no. No, I've got none. I, too, haven't seen too many of their films. Um, I love to Kira Knightley and Begin Again. Did you ever watch that? Nope. It's from the dude, John Carney, who did Sing Street and Once. And he did this in between. It's like her and Mark Ruffalo, Adam Levine's in it, um, Haley Steinfeld's Mark Ruffalo's daughter, and it's it's a it's a pretty fun, solid film from him. Um, Johnny Depp, uh, I think. Times of Grindelwald, best performance. Going off of that, I don't remember much of him in Crimes of Grindelwald. Like I know it starts with him and he has like a speech at the end, but I don't remember. But I do remember. <laughs> watching the first Fantastic Beasts and actually like gasping when Colin Farrell turns out to be Johnny Depp. And that blew my mind. And I don't know if it's because of my stupidity or that it was a good surprise. But I So much. when that happened, I was a little upset because the main reason I saw that movie was because of Colin Farrell. So I was hoping that like at the end of the next movie, he would take off his face again and it would be Colin Farrell again. Hey, <laughs> Anything could happen in that series, except you know, no, nope, I'm, t- I'm not touching that. I'm not. <laughs> we're gonna have to. Dis- we might discuss. We're, we're it in gonna a come weeks. back to that when we yep. talk about Harry Potter. Yeah, we have a couple of weeks for that. Um, but I typically enjoy Johnny Depp. Uh, I enjoyed his small part in into, into the Woods. Um, there's something else recently I watched with him. But anyway, yeah, I, these are all actors I, I relatively enjoy. I'm not giant fans of, typically. Um. Juan, why don't you describe this film for those of you who have not watched it for some reason? Heads up, spoilers All right. When ghostly pirate Davy Jones comes to collect a blood debt, Ooh. Captain Jack Sparrow must find a way to avoid his fate lest his soul be damned for all time. Nevertheless, the wily ghost manages to interrupt the wedding plans of Jack's friends Will Turner and Elizabeth Swan. Swan, Swan. So I was reading off of something you gave me for that. Yes, that's from Google. Just and a you, peek behind the curtain. As you read that, I thought, let's have some fun with it. And I played with some sound effects. I heard. It yeah. felt like I was doing a radio play. You know, in a sense, every podcast that's audio only is a radio play. That is true. Something I want to add uh, as we enter this analysis that I I think is interesting shift in the films we'll be discussing is that this is the first film we'll discuss that was not nominated or won the Best Picture Award at the Oscars. Yeah, actually, it has a uh, Metacritic score in the yellow. Yes, and we'll get to that in a second. But uh, it did receive one, two, three, four nominations for Art Direction, Sound Editing, and Sound Mixing with the win for Best Visual Effects. Um, I always thought it was interesting. Depp was nominated for the first movie for Best Actor, which uh, I, I'd stand by after watching. What are your thoughts on this film? Your general thoughts on this film? Um, it, it was it was okay. It was okay. It, so, a little bit of backstory for the Pirates of the Caribbean: how it became a franchise. It oh, started as a theme park ride at a uh, Disney. And yes. they literally based the movie off of a theme park ride. And watching these movies, you can kind of tell. How so? Because, um, well, the fight scenes are feel like this sort of ride experience. Not necessarily like the sword fights, but like the ones that involve a prop of some kind. 
may I ask um, before you continue, which films did you rewatch for, uh, this week? Uh, just the first and second. Okay. Okay. Just curious. Go on. Like in this movie, the sequence with the big wheel. I can imagine that on a ride. Interesting. And also, like, a lot of the uh, sweeping shots of going through the ships. Like, in the first movie where they're going through the ship when all the people are dead and you see the Skellingtons. Skellingtons. Jack Skellington is here. Yes. I mean, the main character's name is Jack, so. Yes, yes. Actually, that's another thing. Uh, the main characters are not, the main character is not Jack in this. <laughs> Which is why I found that interesting from the uh, synopsis you sent me, that the actual main characters are mentioned right at the end. Do you? Oh, this is an interesting conversation to have. Both you, you think both the first and second movie start with both Elizabeth Swan and Will Turner, and then get to Johnny Depp's uh, Jack Sparrow after like 15, 20 minutes. Yes, but after his introduction, I, f I find that he, maybe it's just the performance, but it feels like he rules the most movies. Yeah, but and, in, and in he has enough, of... enough of a perspective and a narrative going along with them that he's an equal third to lead. I could see that, but the way the scripts are written, it really works with Johnny, D with uh, Jack Sparrow as. I, I can't even imagine. I can't say Jack Sparrow. I can only see Johnny Depp. I can only <laughs> see Johnny Depp. Uh, like most of his, it's best when his motivations are unclear. Sure, sure. Which isn't really a thing with, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Main characters, because if your literal main character's motivation is unclear, you have no idea what's going on. Yeah, it did well. That's that's a fair point. That's a fair point. So that's like an often uh, under misunderstood aspect of these films. Well, uh, it's I think many did misunderstand as to you know Jack. Not only is he the main character in that synopsis, but he's. The main face you see on the posters. Four has no Elizabeth or or Will. Um, and he and Giant Up kind of rules the the uh, franchise after that. But uh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying about him not being a main character. Yeah. I I do think because because as an outsider who never watched them it seemed like everyone just hated these movies because it's the same thing that Depp's performance just gets worse as it goes on which i don't know i've only seen two but i th i found him to be spectacular in in just how alive his body is and how present and how loose everything is you never know not just what he's going to say what he's going to do you don't you don't know which body part is going to move <laughs> If he's going to fling his arm for it, if an eyebrow is going to raise, if he's going to... Maybe his backwards. thigh will just jump up into the air. Maybe a toenail will fly into the air because he bit that toe. <laughs> I didn't like when he bit the toe. But um, I, I completely understand the love, I, at least initial love for him. Because it's, it's, it's really s stands out in this series. Yeah. Because, like, yeah, I, I have nothing to go off of, but, but that, it, that is, a, it is a great performance that was really out there yeah. at the time. And I, I wasn't sure how much we'll go into the first one, but I found in the first one, because it doesn't start with him, it's very much this, it looks like a serious period piece for a while. And as soon as he's introduced, there's this element of zaniness that, that's added to it. And kind of helps with the tone of the P of the entire franchise, at least, in that it is kind of over the top, cartoony. You got all the accents and the voices, and I, I'm a pirate, and I'm gonna talk with the pirate now. And it's it's him who really sets the tone for what these movies are. At least it feels like. If anything, it actually feels like the writing goes more in that direction with this movie. Yes, I. This one felt a lot more over the top compared to the previous one. 
um, one of the things I noticed was that there were fewer. Um, I'll I'll just I'll just put under the umbrella of intimate scenes, in that the first one had a lot of them sailing and just waiting as they sailed, and so you had these character moments where they talk and develop and and learn about the backstory, and you had fewer of those in this, as well as just fewer sword fights, and they were more grander. Uh, 10 billion things happening at one spectacles for most yeah. of the action sequences. And so I wasn't the biggest fan of the action in this one for the most part. Not that I, it was bad, but it all kind of meshed into one. I, I can agree on that point. But uh, again, that also goes ties into the whole roller coaster aspect of it. Hmm. Where like things, when you're going at like 50 miles an hour, things just pass by and you might... You might notice it. You might not. I did love the, you mentioned the wheel fight. I love that entire sequence, which starts with the three of them having this little fight, like this little duel, and they just keep switching who they're pointing at. And it turns in this three-man fight as, as uh, Elizabeth's shouting at them, throwing sand at them. <laughs> and then they slowly move throughout, and they climb up the tower. And, and I love the choreography and the way it plays between who they're focusing on at each time and and the wheel just added this spectacle that didn't it didn't feel too grand for me or too uh, too bombastic it, it had well it right... was also great at um focusing on the key pieces because like there were oh there were a lot of cuts to where the uh the key is mm -mm. like there that was always a focal point that was kept in mind mm -hmm. Um, what did you think of Bloom and or Knightley? You can tell this one was written after they had, like, the first one was written to be like a standalone sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And it feels like that kind of finished their characters. So it kind of feels like they're running in place for this one. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. And I don't think that's any, it's either actor's fault. No, it's just the script. Yeah. Honestly, that's, that's my main complaint with this movie. The script. There's no real evolution for the characters. For any of them. Uh, and another thing that kind of irritated me a little bit. It happened in that same scene that we were just talking about with <laughs> that three of them fighting. Basically, they each explain why they hate the other two <laughs> and why they want the key. But they don't say it directly. They say it from their point of view, and then they cut. And then once they start fighting, they cut to the other two people who are just looking. It's like, oh, that person wants that. That person wants that. <laughs> they hey, want this. Um, yeah, literally, like thirty seconds later, they recap what they just said. They did that so many times throughout the movie, where like they say it in a like piratey way. And then they're like, oh, and for the children in the audience, here's what this actually means. Yeah. It, it, it was definitely written for a younger audience, which is interesting considering it was still PG-13. Do, do you think it was? It feels like it, considering how many times they repeated themselves and dumbed it down. Well, one interesting aspect I noticed watching the two films nearly back to back, I watched them a day apart, was the, the difference in color palette. I found I feel like the first one had a lot more golds, reds, and and like kind of red brownish tinge, like uh, like a fire starting, like there's something around the corner and exploration. This one had a lot of blacks and blues and dark greens, and it was very morose and and sad from out the start. Um, the first one at least had like because they had to have the moon to show the effect of the curse, like. You could see the night sky, but there was so much fog in this one. Well, that also might be because they were working with a lot more special effects, so more masking. But even in not, oh, you know, yeah, it is mainly special effects stuff. That's fair. But it, it felt like it, they were trying to go for a darker thing with this. I mean, it felt like the tone was darker, but the way it was written, it was definitely still written for like eight-year-olds. It felt simpler. I I was shocked that um, 
because I was just expecting just dumb pirate movies, but there's the first one has this kind of inner turmoil about the difference between right and wrong, good versus evil, and and the complexities of our actions. And I found this one kind of tackled living with those actions after you make them, but not not even that much in the same way. Also, you could see a lot of uh, recurrent jokes already in the series. Oh, yeah. Which I assume is just a staple from here on out. Well, I thought it was odd when he made another eunuch joke. <laughs> like, this is what we're going for? <laughs> yeah. What do you think of the humor of these films? Because I, yeah. What do you think of the humor of these films? This partially comes back to the whole this was written for a young audience hmm. with, with like the gross out humor. Is there a lot of gross out outside of the squid spitting on Jack Sparrow? Uh, the toe. Sure. I mean, it's not the main type of humor in it, but it's there. There is and more like, so than the previous film. Yeah. I I I commend these films on its commitment to slapstick and the kind of Looney Tooney esque um, antics that they get through. Like yeah, uh, the uh, fight scenes actually. Uh, damn it, who who was the Jackie Chan? It reminds me of Jackie Chan fight sequences. When when but... something happens and there's that reaction. You see the character reacting to it. And it's like these uh, elements that are in the space itself that are like disrupting the flow of the fight and they have to go work around it. Yeah. Well, I also, just when it starts off, it, it seems very dramatic with the rain and Elizabeth's crying and there's people storming. And then they're like, we have the warrant for your arrest. Here it is. And they're like, oh, this says Elizabeth. Oh, we have the wrong warrant. Here's the other your warrant. I was like, okay, there's going to be some fun in this movie. Hmm. I did find there was, it felt like there were, was less cartoony than the first one. Like, I love in the first one when Jack and Will are trying to sneak off under the boat. They're holding a boat oh, above yeah. them and they're that, hiding that was, underwater. That was fun. And there was, was, fun. There was less of that in this, but there, and there were a lot more quips. Yeah, they replaced. It feels like they replaced a lot of the uh, personality of the first one with spectacle. Mm -hmm. But I, there was some fun with the spectacle. I really enjoyed the the weird god sequence, which I don't know if any of that is... The god sequence? When, when they're like, oh, Jack Sparrow's a god. And so oh. They, I don't know if any of that is insensitive. It feels like it's insensitive. <laughs> I mean, these movies, they don't... They other every single minority. Yeah. But I, uh, yeah, let's sit in the sadness that is mid 2000s lack of representation for one moment. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. But I did, I did find it very funny when he, he was walking around and the fruits were being thrown at him. And then he had the, he was kind of a shish, a shish kebab. And then it, it, he like, who falls off a cliff and it toppled him over. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm watching, I'm like, I shouldn't laugh at this, but I am laughing at it. And then I also enjoyed when the crew is in that like hanging net of a ball, which I don't understand the semantics of how one would even do that. I mean, because just like you create the ball, you put them in the ball, and then you throw it off a cliff with a wire attached. So for those there of you, you who weren't watching, there's like a, a rope bridge and there's a, a, a ball made of net hanging from it with like no, it was a uh, ball made of bones. Was it bones? I didn't realize yeah, that. Yeah, that was the implication from oh, because they were like, oh, some people aren't here anymore. I yeah. See now. But even then, like, so they, weren't they hanging there and then they added a will to it? So that means they pulled it back up, put will in it, and then dropped it back down? Yes. But I did enjoy the sequence of them swinging back and forth and grabbing onto the cliff and climbing up and having that little race as a fun moment as well. Uh, what is there to say about this movie? I, I did, I, going back to the lack of character growth, it bothered me that 
the, the biggest, I guess, inner turmoil in this film, I feel like I said inner turmoil again. Why did I say it? Um, was, is Jack a good person? Jack, is, is he going to be the hero? And I thought they answered that at the end of the first one. <laughs> and so we're doing this again. Oh, it's going to be there throughout the series. Because that's the whole thing. It's like, who's Jack Sparrow? He's 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 a renegade dude. You never know what he's gonna do. But he, I, oh, I'm less excited to watch rest now because I I liked in the first one when he's like, yeah, I'm telling the truth because you're not gonna believe the truth either. And he's like, well, a dishonest person you can never trust because they'll you never know what they're gonna do. An honest person you can never trust because you never know when they'll do something stupid. And he spent that entire first film just waiting for the right moment. My favorite quip from the first movie is like, you're the worst pirate I've ever, I've ever heard of, but you have heard of me. (laughs) Uh, There's a lot of great moments in that first one. And then the second one, I think you lose a lot of that fun. And as mentioned before, a lot of the character development because they're going for the spectacle, because they're going a, a much more epic and grand scale this also definitely feels more like a part one than its own standalone it movie. It does. Uh, and we should mention it was filmed similar to Thor of the Rings. They filmed uh, Dead Man's Chestnut World's End back to back. And so you, uh, I would only assume a film, you approach it differently when you know for a fact it's yeah, yeah. connected to the next. I mean, basically you could compare this to the Matrix trilogy. They made those the same way. You can. As someone who has not watched those movies, I cannot or should not. I could... But then I wouldn't trust what I'm saying, you know? Like, literally, the first movie was made in, like, uh, 97, and then two first, and three were, like, 2002. First film was born, well, first for one was released in 99, two and three released in 2003, about six months apart. Hmm. This one was weird. So, going into the two and the three, I've never seen three. I always thought it was odd that Pirates 2 and 4 both made a billion dollars, but three didn't. And so I was doing a little research. Um, it's simply just release date. Pirates 2 came out in July near the end of the summer movie season. And so it had no competition after. 3 came out two weeks after Spider-Man 3, a week after Shrek the 3rd. And then it had, a, I can't remember what, it had a bunch of competition after it as well. Hmm. And so it's interesting seeing the importance of release dates. This is our first summer release. And well, it might also be that like they were extremely confident at that point that the pirates would be able to carry itself. Sure, and they probably could think of it, but but also just looking at what happened, it it's the domestic gross was is like four hundred twenty, I think I said for Dead Man's Chest, and at Worlds, and it's like three hundred one, like it's a hundred million dollars less or fewer between releases, which is a giant drop. Yeah. And the international growth actually went up as well. Well, also, it's funny that uh, we were talking about how simplified this one was. People found the third one confusing. I was actually excited to, to enter the third one. But with that, the fact that it's like a half hour longer, I'm... It's actually only like a, a 15 minutes longer or something it, like that. Well... Something I noticed with these two films, the first two, is that there's literally like 10 minutes of credits. And so I'll say, I'll say like 225, but it's really two hours, 15 minutes, which changes my mind a lot when, when thinking about films to watch. Right, right. Um, what else is there to talk about? Do you uh, think that Will is a reluctant hero? Hmm. I had that thought watching this because I, I I watched the first one. What do you mean by reluctant? Um, kind of being thrust into this this position and doesn't want to be in the same way that a um Frodo or Luke Skywalker was was kind of thrown into this situation without wanting to be in. I could see that, except uh, I mean, there wasn't a moment where he refused the call to action. Sure, sure. He he really did just kind of jump into it. I did want to bring up that watching the first one, I got such strong hints of Titanic. Yeah, it's it's another big boat movie. Um, 
Honestly, not... like two out of the first three movies that we talk about, big boat movies. Well, no, the big boat fans really showed up for this. Big boat fans, wow. Big boats. Such gigantic boats <laughs> and such fanatic fans. But I found there was a dynamic between uh, between the love triangles, which replicated Titanic to T. Yes, yes. You had Elizabeth Swan slash Rose, who were, who were betrothed to assholes. The Commodore for, for their slash. Status. I don't even remember his name. I think his name was Cal. I think his name was Cal. But yes, Rose oh. and and Elizabeth are both betrothed, but they're in love with this poor man. Who's of a lower caste. And I am in love with both Elizabeth Swan and Rose. Continuing the recurring bits in each of these movies. But Again, also, I also, much like Titanic, it doesn't feel earned, the romance. All the relationships feel very... So, like, all the connections... The dialogue of this and like the way actions happened, it straight up felt like I was reading a, a Magic Tree House book. Magic Tree House? <laughs> what, magic, this... what Magic Tree House are you reading where Arthur hooks up with, with Miss Frizzle? Like, what is going on that there's romance in these books? Miss Frizzle? Magic Tree? Oh, I'm thinking Tree. <laughs> <laughs> I've never read the Magic Treehouse, so uh, it, Christian, it, are we gonna edit that out? No, we're not. Ah, oh, damn it, Christian. Go on. It it really felt like um, the dialogue was there just to generate these scenes that were fun to watch, as opposed to letting the character progression carry the story. Well, I have a question for you. Why are Elizabeth and um? will in love with each other other than he woke up from like a coma saw her and then eight years later they're in love uh because he's poor that's the hottest trait according to these movies <laughs> so does she she oh she does kind of it bothered me in this one when there's like a weird flirty between her and him her and, and uh, Jack, Jack Sparrow. And, and it, it kind of pays off in the end when she handcuffs him to the ship in that she's she, it's kind of her outsmarting him because she is a very smart uh, lady. If anything, that was actually just the one element of the script that felt like they were trying to do anything with the characters and it felt out of place. Yeah, so it, what bothered me was the fact that she's so in love with Will and then the compass is like, you want Jack? That's the one piece that that messed it for me. Like her playing at the end as as like this chess game where she outsmarts Jack at the end. I'm like, okay, then I understand this this flirting is kind of like a weapon in this moment. But the fact that the compass was saying she wants Jack was what what confused Yeah, that me. does throw a wrench into the whole idea. But it's fine. It felt very forced. I was not enjoying that aspect of the it, film. If anything, it's more like that. That feels like a moment that doesn't like work with what comes later. But in the moment where it occurred, it felt like what the script needed. Are you talking about the flirting or the hand the cutting? compass? Okay, the compass. They totally just retcon what that compass was, right? <laughs> Yeah, unless they had it like in a notebook after the first one, like they randomly gave significance to the compass and gave it some mystical power of, oh, if you want to point to what? Well, actually, in the first movie, it did lead to the aisle. Okay, then I'm an asshole and I'm going to retract that statement. But like who said all compasses needed to face north? Have you met Joe? No, Joe's my compass guy. You haven't met Joe? Uh, which one? I, I know Joe who fixes cars. Okay, I think that's his cousin. I'm, I'm going to send you his information after this. I'm going to text you the information don't. and then I'll connect you because I think everyone should have a compass guy. I mean, 
I don't want to steal your compass guy though. He he's a great compass guy. He works for millions of compasses, compasses around <laughs> the world. <laughs> he works a- for the compasses. <laughs> Um, yes, compasses are your com- Muppets after you fail to pay your compass tax. And so he collects them. He, he's a very knowledgeable man on. Oh, the so he's like industry. a compass repo man. Uh, that's one of his many titles, yes. I see, I see. All right, so back to uh, the Kraken. The How did you feel about the Kraken? I don't know. I think I'm going to land on the side of I didn't like it. In in this, we were discussing earlier. All these action sequences were so epic, and so much was happening that there was no real fear or tension to it. It was just boom, boom, <laughs> and and you know, you never actually saw the Kraken, which I guess could be cool until the end. And but even then, it it I never felt like they had a chance of losing. I mean, again, this is that that brings me to the scene where um Swan was uh trying to get those papers and then she was holding the gun to that dude. Mm-hmm. Because of like the audience for this movie and what it was going for, all the tension of that scene was lost because I was like she's not going to do it. Was that the? I don't think they'd ever. But like the you... fact that he never called her on it felt. Sure, that makes sense. I enjoyed that scene very much because I I was worried that they were gonna leave her in the jail cell the entire film. So like, oh yeah, she's doing something. She's she's making stuff happen. She's 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 basically this is basically Rose after Titanic. In that she's living her life and doing stuff. Another uh, thing that actually reminded me of Titanic was that scene where, was that shot where the dress was like floating in the water. Can we talk about this scene? <laughs> Can we talk about this freaking scene with the dress flying? Go ahead. When did she learn how to puppeteer? <laughs> <laughs> when? She I mean, is is that the thing that you need explained of everything there's, in this movie? There's many things. You no, know that's actually fair because everything's explained in this movie except for that. Yeah, and she she knows how to build it, and like the the crew members of that ship are right there. Can they not see the strings even if Listen, it's night? It's because pirates are stupid. But they weren't the pirates on that ship. People on ship <laughs> are stupid. They don't like women woman bad on ship and woman was on ship so they were all stupid also (laughs) how does no one know who's on your freaking ship (laughs) she jumps on the ship in disguise like oh there's a woman on the ship and she's just she's just like yeah i'm painting i'm painting the side of the ship yo but she she had the like rubber band how can you tell she's a woman oh well on on the other hand you also had the two the two bumbling duo from um, the first film, who just jump on the Black Pearl and no one questions where they come from? I mean, because like the Black Pearl ex- is accepts all, and they were previously members of the ship that just came back. That's how it works. Yes, they were previously members who were left to die for like six months and then come back, and no one's like, "What? You look familiar. Do I know you?" Well, they weren't intentionally left to die. I did not enjoy those characters. Uh, Pintel and Rogetti. And again, not the actor's fault, but they felt so unnecessary. Yeah, it just felt like another wrench to throw in to like make this uh, like extremely complicated thing even more complicated. But even then, they had to explain it multiple times. Yeah. And what bothered me for... Like the first ones, the stuff they did on the beach, I enjoyed. But before that, it, they were the comic relief in a film with Johnny Depp's Jack Sparrow. Why do you need more comic relief when he brings so much to the plate? That's fair. It felt. I mean, like they overkill. might be more utilized in the third movie because you know, at the end of this one, Depp's dead. And what? 
Mm, again, why were they like, yeah, I'll risk my life for this man who we were going to try to kill? Because it's, it's Captain Jack Sparrow. He's a great man. Did you realize that the, the woman in that like magic place was Naomi Harris? She... Oh, God, I don't... Oh, there's problems with, with, with the character, but I just wish... Oh, no, 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 no. it gets worse in the third one. <laughs> no. Also, I didn't know Zoe Saldana was in the first Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Yeah, because everyone who's darker than white is just, has so much makeup and like is othered to the point of like not being able to see who they are. Well, I do wonder if she was meant to, if they wanted to have her be a larger role. Because from what I read, she chose to leave the franchise because she didn't like the business and how uh, smaller names in the in the production were treated. So maybe she was meant I to mean, have a larger role. Yeah, because basically all the smaller names in this movie. Like the Commodore, the scene where they were, where uh, Jack runs into uh, Elizabeth on the uh, on the gangway leading into up to the ship. I literally didn't recognize the Commodore at first with all the shit in his no. face. I generally could not tell him part with the um. I don't even know what the character's name is. The dude who's like, "Oh, I'm gonna arrest you." What's what, is he like a governor? What is he? I don't know. And they <laughs> won an Academy Award for makeup. And literally the makeup obscured. You can't tell these characters apart. That's a failure right um, there. They did not win for makeup. They won for visual effects. How dare you insult oh. this Academy Award winning film? They weren't even nominated for makeup. So that's why. Okay. Yeah, that's, <laughs> they weren't that's nominated fair. for me best makeup for this film because you couldn't tell the white people apart. <laughs> <laughs> Two white men. Same man. I did enjoy the the random Jonathan Price. I was unaware that he was in this franchise. He's Elizabeth's dad. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, great in Game of Thrones, the wife, two popes, Vita. Has a Tony Award for playing an Asian man, which is a problem we can discuss another time. But a very talented man that I enjoyed very much. Probably the little he adds to the, the film. We have yet to discuss either Davy Jones or William Turner. I mean, we did at the beginning. We, you were like, what do you think of Will Turner? I was like, he's there. No, no. William, the father. Oh, William. Well, right. we can talk about Will Turner because I have a little to say about Will Turner. Okay, go ahead. And no offense to Orlando Bloom. Orlando Bloom seems like a really cool guy. He's dreamy. As when the first film began and he started talking, I'm like, great. Orlando Bloom is going to actually have a character to play rather than just look cool, right? First movie ends, and I was like, oh, no, I was wrong. He does not have a character to play. Yeah. <laughs> There's no growth to him at all. There's nothing other than that he's heroic and wants to save Elizabeth. And it But, like, it's also this. kind of a shame because I, I do genuinely think he is a good actor. I'm sure he is. I would have no reason to believe not. It's just he got these characters that are just hey look cool and do cool action which he does he does the action well he sells it well but like also if anything that's a good thing to be typecast as because boy did he have a lot of fans in it, the teenage range it so we were both young when these movies came out but i remember it felt like orlando bloom and kira knightley were these gigantic names doing everything and so it shocks me specifically for Bloom in that he doesn't have the biggest filmography post Pirates. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I read he wanted to do more stage stuff after, and so he has some stage stuff. But I'm looking at his filmography. He. Yeah, there's no, no really big thing he does except for The Hobbits again, another Pirates. A bunch of smaller movies, which like, okay, it's good to do smaller movies, but outside of Lord of the Rings, Pirates, Kingdom of Heaven, Troy, oh, those yeah, are all he like was in Kingdom of Heaven. I have yet to watch that one. I've told you when I watched Kingdom of Heaven, right? Yeah, your your teacher had some interesting choices back in like fifth grade. <laughs> in sixth grade. Uh, oh, we... so then it's okay for you to watch R-rated movies. My oh, well, bad. well, first was Apocalypto. 
we were learning about Mayan's ass technique as he showed us Apocalypto, and there was a forum that you could What sign. better way to learn about uh, ancient tribes than Mel Gibson? Exactly. And so we did that. After that, in learning about Japan, we watched The Last Samurai. What better way to learn about <laughs> samurai than from Tom Cruise? <laughs> Obviously. Obviously. And then Crusades, we hit Kingdom of Heaven, which something I forgot about. So when we would watch them in class, because we watched the entire movie, he wanted us to take notes. And I don't you know. You saw the entire movie? Yes, in class. In sixth grade? Yes. And like no parents had a problem with this? There was a form for, I think, just Apocalypto. Wow, because in in my like middle school and stuff like that, they were like hesitant to even show us PG thirteen movies, and they had like forms for that. One, well, I'm from Jersey City. All right, we have city in our name. You don't mess with us. All right. Am I the person to represent Jersey City? No. But you can see in the, the films that we provide our children that we are not to be messed. Yeah, getting education from Mel Gibson. <laughs> Mel Gibson, Tom Cruise, who we wanted to learn about Japan, Crusades through Orlando Bloom and Ridley Scott. And then, you know, I, I really don't know anything about that movie, so I can't make a quippy joke about it. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't remember. So again, we were told to take notes each class on the movie, which I guess was just me writing the synopsis as I watched the <laughs> scenes. But I remember one day, I guess I was absent, so I was like, what am I supposed to do? And my grandpa has the DVD for Kingdom of Heaven. <laughs> and so I just throw it in. Wait, I'm was it like, the director's cut or the theatrical? I, I assumed the director's cut was on it, and I just watched it theatrical. I, I was like 12. I don't know what I did. Because apparently for that one, the director's cut made a world of difference in the quality of that movie. That's what they say. That's what they say about Kingdom of Heaven, a film we weren't planning on discussing this week. <laughs> Not at all. But it's here. It is here. It is here. So back to Bill Turner. Bootstrap Bill. Uh, do you have anything to say? I don't. <laughs> to be honest, I do not. So I was watching it and I was like, I think I recognize that guy behind the starfish and all the barnacles. And then I looked on IMDb and it was Stellan Skarsgård. Mm -hmm. It's a shame they didn't utilize him well in this one. But he comes back. Uh, I I do remember him having a big presence in the movie. So he's definitely a big presence in the third one then. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, he... I feel like they didn't give him much. To I mean, do. they gave him a dice game. Yeah. And like all the fun makeup. There's that weird scene when he's like scaring jack i don't even know what that scene was in the beginning His oh first the, scene. that was them explaining that uh the the tentacle man was coming for him okay there go man well maybe there's a good time to talk about the tentacle man himself davy jones he's Literally there by bill nighy is that how? i never knew is it nighy i i i guess i i don't know i haven't heard it said He's fun. That's all I can say. I, I like the scene where like the tentacles were playing the uh, pipe organ. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love the, the visual effects of his, his beard. The tentacle beard he had. And for the most part, I felt like the visual effects held up. And, and I, I was never taken out of the experience. Hmm. Were you? Are you thinking of moments where you're taken out of the experience? I'm trying to... I remember there was one moment where that occurred, but I don't remember exactly where it was at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you can see, I wasn't taking notes like you did back in sixth grade. <laughs> well, not only in sixth grade, I was taking notes again. I can't see it. Last time I did this, <laughs> the same thing happened. For those of you listening, I tried to show my phone to the audience. And it was just bright white was coming bright off the screen. <laughs> so I have a notes here. Uh, let's see. Darker grays and blues and greens. Mossy, we talked about the color palette, the fogginess of it. Um, I liked the mix-up of the warrants. There was an odd... So in the first film, I remember noticing like a, a golden cross in the treasures underwater. I was like, oh, 
that's that's odd they have christian imagery and 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 actual objects in a disney film but okay i i understand it's a treasure and then this film you uh davy jones when he's first executing people there's a guy praying with a cross and then you have the scene yeah of th- there's Pinto. a lot of elements that are just weirdly there Pinto and Regetti, when they're first introduced, are rowing on, on a boat. And I don't know which one's which, but one of them is trying oh, to read talk a about Bible. the Bible. <laughs> and they're like, I'm reading the Bible. And there's like, you don't know how to read your line. That's a bad thing for him. And he's like, well, trying to read is something. And I'm like, I mean, Disney is definitely a Christian company. Sure, but we're not going to see these elements in Avengers or to this blatantly in star wars or zootopia or toy story 3 it, it's more of a remnant of like early disney this sort sure. of stuff uh speaking of like elements that i that fell out of place yeah. i don't know what the point of the running gag joke with the candlestick being broken was is that a running joke yeah like at the beginning of the first movie when uh uh orlando bloom is like waiting for elizabeth he's like fitzing around with the candelabra on the wall and he breaks it and then here the dad does it right yeah it could be a uh because i don't know what happens in the later film but it could be a star wars um i have a bad feeling about this like i think they want to do each movie or it could just be simply you know awkward physical comedy in, 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 in an awkward place. Because isn't the dad there when they're like, oh, I can't wait to, to have sex with you tonight. <laughs> they're like professing their love to each other in the cell. Oh, and the dad's yeah. there and he's like, I, I don't want to be listening to this. Let me touch the can. Oh, he broke it. It's, all, it. it's also in like the same geographical location. Yeah. Yeah. So like, are they just saying that, you know... England's uh, territories just were really poor. I don't know. Possibly. But like no other element showcases that except for this candelabra that yeah. keeps breaking. Maybe it's about how candelabras are outdated and we'll, we will need to evolve from candelabras and we shouldn't trust them. We should not trust Lumiere. Does it count as a candelabra if it's connected to a wall? Or must they be handheld? Like one may hold mm. Lumiere. I thought it was like the trident sort of deal makes it's it a candelabra. It's the shape that makes it a candelabra? Yeah. Because I would assume there's a different word for a, a wall-mounted version. Uh, I mean, they're all lights. Sure. <laughs> sure. Hit the switch. Are you hitting the switch? I feel like we've been a little down. I I thought I liked this movie a lot more than than I realized as I discussed it. But I do want to throw in um I something that I liked about uh a lot of the action, especially with the sword fights. Mm-hmm. Uh going back to the first one, one of my favorite action sequences is that opening fight between Jack and Will while, where they're in the blacksmith. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yes. And they're jumping on top of scenery and on the on the bars and whatnot. And it had a very parkour feel to it. And I that loved... one's the one that felt the most like a uh, Jackie Chan fight. Yeah, yeah, because because uh, and especially in the first one, more so in the second. Second, there was a lot of interacting with the environment. Yeah, because it, there again, it was less uh, special effects, so it was more grounded in reality. Yeah, and I I wanted to point out that I'm I'm not a sound guy. But I very much enjoyed the sound design in the first film. In every click of the swords, every swash of the sword in the air, every cannon shoot, it, you felt. Yeah, it felt a lot more tactile. Yes, that's the word I wrote in here. Tactile. Score, tactile feel. The score. That's See, the I don't know thing. why I said score here, but uh, yes, we can discuss the score. Uh, that's another, that's also something I forgot to mention last week when we were talking about Lord of the Rings. Okay. 
that, that these are very memorable scores. That is an element I very much enjoy about both these franchises. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shout outs. We briefly shouted him out, but whatever. Shout out to Hans Zimmer, who really killed it with the, the Pirates music. In this film specifically, I think I noticed it less because a lot of it is feels very much like the first one, but I did enjoy the sequence when Davy Jones's men first came on the beach. And the score hits, and there's a little more like a, a grunge feel to it. Did you notice this? I'll be honest, I didn't. And then it pops up later on um, during the, the fight between the two boats. But yeah, shout out to Hans Zimmer. I hope he gets to do some cool stuff in the future. Like a, maybe a music festival. Maybe, maybe a bat or a man or space or war. Maybe he should have done something with some lions and some kings. Call up Elton John to 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 do the songs while he does the music. I'd also like to shout out the person who wrote the score for the uh, Lord of the Rings movies, Howard Shore, while we're at it. Are we just going to make up for all the fuck-ups in all the previous episodes? No, I just felt like doing that one. We're did we not mention the score we did last not. week? Because we I did remember mentioning it all. during Titanic. I just assume we do it every time. We did not mention it during okay. Lord of the Rings. I do want to shout out while well, we're doing shout outs. Can you vamp a bit while I look for the names? All right. You know, we're here. We're promoting others. You know, you got to uplift everyone else because if you're tearing other people down, what, what are you really contributing other than making less space for everyone else? So we, I think we do need to shout out uh, all the production team because usually we do just talk about the main faces that you see, but visual effects team uh, led by John Knoll, Hal T. Hickel, Charlie Gibson, Alan Hall, the art direction team, which I loved. I love the sets for these films and 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 the feel. And, they are uh, pretty solid, yeah. Uh, by led by Rick Heinrichs and Cheryl Karasix. And then the sound team, the sound editing team being Christopher Boys and George Waters the second. And the sound mixing team being Paul Massey, Christopher Boys, and Lee Orloff. My glasses are not on, so I may have be misreading Orloff, but it looks like it's Orloff. Shout out to de- to them folks. Yeah. Cause I think I think something we'll find as we're approaching these films with not as complex and deep um, scripts is that the spectacle is what it overpowers it. it. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's a shame that we don't know these visual effects artists or the production artists or the sound people. We don't know those names in the same vein that we will know a Orlando Bloom who played no one for the past two weeks of our (laughs) podcast. Again, not an insult to Bloom. Not in Mr. Bloom, if you're listening or watching. We're fans of your work. It's more so the script. I mean, I personally thought that there was a bit of character to Legolas, but you know what? You go off. I found Legolas, because Legolas says like three words every 90 minutes. There's so much happening in those movies. Like, yeah. Moving on. Uh, I did find, I liked Bloom. It, it, if, and it, it's hard to articulate fully, but just a, a, as a performance, like it's all in the eyes. You see yes. how committed he is to each, how it affects him in the moment. And, and he, he did a, a very good job. And, you know, that's, that's where the heart starts to throb too, in the eyes. Speaking of throbbing, one of my throbbing favorite, hearts. One of my favorite <laughs> jokes in this movie was, um, I think it's when Elizabeth's first on the ship, and her and Jack are talking about how his compass doesn't work, and Jack's like, "My compass works," and then uh, it 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 cuts to a, a little bit of a wider shot, and there's a cannon right in front of his crotch. I like, I like I, sexual innuendos. I enjoy this visual gag. <laughs> you know, it feels like whenever there's like 
a slightly edgier children's movie, they always have to throw in one hidden dick joke. Wasn't too hidden. But like it was it's hidden good. from eight it's year very olds. Fun. It was very fun. Yes, it like, was. That's what I mean. It's good that we're hiding dicks from eight year olds. Eight year olds should not be exposed to dicks. Unless it's their own. If they if they don't have access to their own dick, that's a problem. I was gonna make the same joke, but wasn't sure if that's appropriate. Listen, so if children you're canceled, have genitalia, if we you're canceled, that, all right, and I'm not, you're gonna have to live with these choices. Like, but what you we know what? I'm gonna drag film. you down with me because you're a part of this podcast too. I and you just invite, sat there and accepted this. I did invite you to this <laughs> podcast and gave you the forum. I gave you. I am now NBC. And I'm going to end the analogy before I mention names I don't want to mention. There's a lot of names. <laughs> Can I ask you something about this film? Go ahead. Because we mentioned how there's less time of them standing and talking on the ship as it sails. This, ha I don't even know if I have a question. This feels very much like later Game of Thrones when characters just show up in places. Did you see Game of Thrones? I didn't. Yes. But so one of the complaints with later seasons, I don't know what you're saying. Is, are no, you I was just asking. Okay, okay. <laughs> so in the later seasons, there is a complaint in that it used to be you're trekking from city A to city B. That's going to take you in the entire season, and then it started becoming like in one episode you make the same trek on foot, and that seemed odd. I mean, they were and, just trying to wrap up the story at that point. Well, with this film specifically, I, I'll point to when in the final fight. When out of nowhere, Jack Sparrow is in a boat far away from the ship. And then he turns around. And while the boat is being attacked by this Kraken, trying to, trying to bring it down, he somehow climbed, climbed up on the ship with no one noticing him and landed well, I mean, right near it's, a gun. It, that's not that hard to not notice him considering how chaotic that scene was. But even but that's not the only case. There were just it, it seemed like everyone was teleporting to places suddenly i could see that and that kind of bothered me well i mean that's also just a factor of the 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 idea that they need to just get everything going as quick as possible hmm. Hmm. it's just an element of the I, the thing where they were just using the dialogue to get to the next set piece and like explain it and the stakes of that sure sure which also is what adds to the idea that this makes a, you know, Martin Scorsese was talking about how the Marvel movies feel like theme park rides. And I agree with that statement, but go on. The true theme park ride movie, I'd say, is Dead Man's Chest. Because, like, much like a theme park you get all the explanations for like the story or whatever done before you actually go on the ride and like it's completely divorced from it. Hmm. That's a fair that's a fair assessment. That's a fair assessment. Like with theme parks, you know, when you're on the line, they have some blurbs and stuff and like mannequins or something to set up the story and then you go on the thrill ride and here they had that with just like dialogue explaining itself over and over again. You ever go on the actual Pirates ride? Um, so I think I went to Disney World when I was like six or seven hmm. or like five, maybe. Hmm. I don't remember any of it. Okay. I've been on it. Um, I'm the worst person to go to theme parks with because I don't like rides. I don't like roller coasters. Um, I don't like rides in general. Uh, the I, I hate feeling that excited and also i get scared because i've read wikipedia pages mentioning and listing the number of deaths that have happened at theme parks yeah i saw uh i saw the open the like catalyst scene in final destination 3 a little too early <laughs> i wonder how often we'll mention final destination 3 <laughs> on this podcast but yeah i i enjoy the ride for the most part but it does start with like a drop and that freaked me out as a kid. Wait, it even... starts with a drop. So it's it's you're 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 kind of floating for a while, and there's like the dialogue, people saying stuff, and there's like a waterfall, and I think it's Davy Jones's face. And as you it go, starts with a waterfall it, drop. You fall That's down, weird. 
and it feels like it's more than it, I think it actually is. And then you go through everything. So it does the reverse of most big drop waterfall rides. Yeah. I don't know if this is true, but I, I yeah. assume that the entire ride is underground. And so it's it's going down to, to the ride. Mm. Then. I may Maybe have made that's that what set it apart and made it uh, its own movie. You ever think about how Disney tried to do a bunch of theme park movies? I was about to bring that up. Haunted Mansion. Haunted Eddie Mansion. Murphy. That was a thing. Is it the country the country jam bears? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Uh oh, let me look up. Jamboree ba- bears? Uh something like that. For the uninitiated, there's a film based off a Disney park ride. Oh, it's not even a ride. It's you go in and it's animatronics singing. These bears sing. Country, country Bear songs. Jamboree. Oh. Uh, that's a terrible attraction. Anyways, the film is like a bunch of actors in mocap or cgi playing these bears i think i didn't see that one is one of them i I saw haunted mansion in theaters though i never watched any of these i only saw commercials for them on disney channel all the time growing up with the caveat that like some uh scenes may be inappropriate for younger viewers i remember that it would have been inappropriate for me when we went to disney uh, my family wanted to go on Haunted Mansion. I was like, I don't want to go on the Haunted Mansion. Oh, that's the one. And so it, they went it's on one the of the ride. rides with the big drop, right? I don't think there like... was even a drop. No, that's that's the the, the Tower of Pain, the power, the Tower of Scare. That's mm. the, the the Twilight Zone one, which is now uh, Guardians of the Galaxy one. No, this is basically, I believe, it's the same thing as like Pirates or it's a Small World. It's just the Haunted I Mansion. See, I see. And so I was like, I don't like the name Haunted. I don't want to ride this. So I just stood in the corner of Disney for like 30 minutes as they went on the ride. I mean, just for the audience, uh, Masinson's the type of person who never finished a Kingdom Hearts game until recently because he was scared of the final world. Excuse me, I've never finished a Kingdom Hearts game. I have not touched the games recently. Not out of fear, but just who has the time. I mean, my statement still stands because... I might I might have implied something, but I didn't outright say anything for the about uninitiated you recently. For the uninitiated, the Kingdom Hearts games are a franchise of video games in which uh, the video game company Square Enix merges the worlds of the Final Fantasy series with Disney worlds. I've mentioned that I played Kingdom Hearts 2, where there's a Pirates of the Caribbean world. I may mention these games in the future when we discuss later Disney films. Frozen was definitely a world in the third one. Did you play three? I never played three. I started three. You know, it's funny because I was so hyped for three that I literally went back and played the ones I was missing. Okay. And like, I, I got all the DS ones when they came out. I was a big fan of this mm-hmm. series. But then like when I actually started playing three, I got like four worlds in and I'm like, oh, this there's just way too much filler here. Are there that many worlds? Fun- I thought there was only a few worlds, like relatively a few. Four seems like they're it's most really the long. Okay, I see. Is the thing? Yeah, like it takes nine hours to get through a world. Oh, no, I was saying I when you said four worlds, it sounds like you played most of the game. No, no, no. okay. I yeah. had just gone to the, like the second hub of worlds. I remember, I remember freaking out when that game was announced at E three, and like calling my cousin into my room to watch when they announced it, and then the game came out. And I was like. I, I have school. I don't have money. You know, the funny thing yeah. is for me, whenever it's like whenever I'm hyped for a game before it's released, I just lose all of that hype once it's there. Mm. But like if I'm hesitant about a game beforehand, that's the one I'll really dive into. Speaking of hype, I really enjoyed the ending of this film. <laughs> yeah. Barbosa needed to come back sooner. He's such a great character. I'll be honest. When they're like, Oh, you're going to get a new captain. I'm like, is it? Is it? Is it? And then Jeffrey Rush walks down. He has the monkey on him. He bites a green apple. And I was like, yes. Honestly, what what they do with him is uh, synonymous with uh, what uh, Dragon Ball Z did with Vegeta. (laughs) Please explain. (laughs) So Vegeta was the first main enemy during the first arc of Dragon Ball Z. Okay. He's he's the one with the famous quote where uh, he asks, 
what's Kakarot's power level? And then Nappa goes, it's over 9,000. And then he's okay. like, what 9,000? And it's like, that that's a big deal because no one's power level is over 9,000. No, no. <laughs> but then like, as the as the series goes on, he literally just gets like married to one of the like main characters from like even all the way back to Dragon Ball. And like he just becomes domesticated and now he's just friends with everyone, including Goku. Is the moment when I'd like to thank all our lo- our listeners and viewers who stick with us through our odd <laughs> analogies and references to pop culture. The show's back from 1985. Is it that old? Yes. Uh, I didn't realize that. So the thing is, it didn't air in America until like the early 2000s, sure, but in sure. Japan it came out. It went from 85 to 95. Mm-hmm. That's why the animation is very dated. Going back to Dead Man's Chest. And just the franchise in general. I'm enjoying these post credit scenes. Have you been watching them? Or have you been skipping them? Uh, so I, I missed the one in the first movie. Uh-huh. Uh, this one... I saw it. I forgot what it was. So the, uh, the thing with these post credits... So this is pre-MCU. So the, it really... I, I doubt many people saw them. But they're very much in line with the shawarma... Uh, Avengers scene and that it's just a short little reference and it's kind of silly. So the first one is like, oh, the monkey's still alive and he's in the cave and maybe Barbosa's back, but the monkey and this one was um, so there was the dog that was being chased after by the tribe and so right. the dog is sitting on the, the throne as like the new god <laughs> and that's it. And there's nothing much to it, but it's very funny and silly and I found that they could have just cut that like first third of the movie of the. the oh yeah, the because uh, you know I actually checked. Davy Jones literally shows up at the hour mark. Really? Yes. That's right. So you could cut probably like minute ten to fifty nine. Because <laughs> I think yeah, you could a... you could toss out all the uh, tribal wackiness othering. Yeah. That I was w- literally superfluous for the rest of the script. But I wanna, again, yeah. it, it also created a lot of fun, like theme park ish moments. Oh, yeah. So I think that's why they kept it. It is very wacky and fun, and probably the most I smiled during the film. Um, but as as a piece of as a narrative, it's so superfluous. Which feels I, interesting because of how utilitarian the rest of the script is after that. Hmm. I wanted to ask you, as we go through these movies, I want to end our analysis talk with, what do you think the legacy of this film is? Because I uh, think, had they cut out the first hour of this movie and probably cut out stuff from three, they could probably could have made one movie and there would have been less f- franchise fatigue. Hmm. Because I think it's odd. You haven't seen three. No, I have not. I have not. So maybe I'm speaking out of my ass. They can't. There's way too much that happens in the third one. Could they? Because here's the thing: we went through Titanic and the Lord of the Rings franchise, both critically acclaimed, made a lot of money. But when you talk about their legacy, both films very memeified. So many. That's true. This one. Uh, I mean, it feels like this could have... Ha- I'd say the legacy of this is the Lone Ranger. Is it? Because that was the main takeaway. It's like, how can we take the main element that everyone seems to enjoy, Johnny Depp, and do something similar but different enough to spin off into its own thing? Pin in that. Is Johnny Depp as the god figure in all of that tribal where uh tonto 1.0 <laughs> yes that's exactly uh, what i'm saying now pulling out the pin is that not just them trying to replicate the success by legacy i'm more curious how do you think the public perceives this franchise well yeah I, see the thing is i also think that the fact that that's what the studio got from it that it influenced how people going back to this also feel about it mm. 
It really much it feels like people only remember Jack Sparrow and nothing else. Exactly. Yeah. You, you never watched five, right? Uh, uh, I just saw the Gore Verbinski ones. Okay. Because we're gonna we did the first. Oh, well, we talked about the first two. Uh, we're gonna talk about four. I'll watch. I actually kind of want to watch three this week now that I watched two. You know, I it's think- interesting in this. <laughs> In this episode about Dead Man's Chest, we I think we talked more about uh, Curse of the Black Pearl. I think like <laughs> we kind of covered the series as a whole in the same way we did uh, Lord of the Rings. Also, it's just so much of it, you know, the story beats, the, the, the quote-unquote character arc in this movie, it's it's so much of it's it is It's just repeated. stagnating, yeah. It just exists. Yeah. And it's not even, a, I don't think it's a bad movie. I mean... It's not terrible, but I wouldn't necessarily call it great either. No. But I had a lot of fun, and it it isn't until we started dissecting this that I thought, I don't know if I liked this movie. Because I had a lot of fun in the moment. I I definitely was looking at the clock for most of it. Mm. Mm. Well, those are our thoughts. Yeah, we've given our, uh, our personal opinions. However, how, go ahead. Sometimes we like to spice stuff up. Sometimes we go in the cabin filled with knives and axes, and you find, what was that, paprika? We're going to open up the paprika. we we'll pour it all over ourselves, shake that paprika around. Use it like a deodorant, specifically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pawn meta. Mm-hmm. Would you like to start uh, this segment of how will we make it better, or shall I start? Uh, you know what? I think I think you should start. Should I start? Should yes. I start? All right, so I'm going to be honest. I had a little trouble figuring out how I would uh, make this film better. So I had to use my whiteboard to write down some notes. Mm-hmm. So, so as, uh, as I mentioned, I found this film to be much darker and more serious. In the first film, not a lot of character-driven stuff. Especially the comedy wasn't as character-driven as the first one was. I felt right, right. Um, and I always found it odd that three made less money than two. And so I think they just need to cast a wider net and get a larger audience. And this is how I will do it. All right. Mm-hmm. So the scene of Will Turner. He, his dad, has lost the bet with Davy Jones. He's like, Dad, my plan. You messed up my plan. Do you like my Orlando Bloom? <laughs> Dad, you messed up my plan. What am I to do? So he, he sneaks into Davy Jones's room. Davy Jones, as one does, falls asleep at his organ. Of course, as one does. As one does. And so Orlando Bloom's like, oh, where's the key? Let me move around his te- tentacle. Oh, there's the key. How will I get the key? From Davy Jones. So he moves around the tentacles. And what? Davy Jones wakes up. Urgh! Will Turner, what are you doing here? Why are you touching my tentacles? And it was like, uh, uh, Dave, Davy Jones? I, whoa, I, I heard you have a, an organ. An organ, and I play the organ sometimes. I know how to tickle the keys. Davy Jones like, Urgh, well, I don't believe you. Well, uh... You don't play the, the keys unless you will play it, Will. Will you play it, Will? And Will's like, um, um. And then Orlando Bloom pants the camera. Oh. And, then turns and to that's Davey where Jones. it ends? No, no, no. I'm nowhere near done. <laughs> Orlando Bloom turns to Davy Jones like, yeah, I play the keys. And as, you, as we know, Will and Elizabeth known each other for like eight years. Will's probably gone to a, con- a cotillion or two. Watch the T- pianist. Specifically a cotillion. <laughs> that feels like of the era. Probably watched a pianist play some keys. And so he plays a Mozart song. And then Davy Jones is like, oh, wow, you are really good. That's really good. Okay, I'm going to go back to sleep. And then Will's, and then, no, Will's, no, no. Will's playing so beautifully that it puts him back to sleep. And then Will's like, phew. And then takes the key. Now, in the scene, there's like a little tiny music box chesty thingy that's ticking. 
and the music's playing. Well, when Will plays, the music stops. What? And it closes. Huh? And you hear... And some sort of mystical air to the scene now. Cut to later on the film. Will gets to the beach. Finds Jack. Elizabeth and... Um, what's his name? Uh, the Commodore? The Commodore. That's not even his name. That's his position. I couldn't even yeah. remember that. He finds them. The first thing that he sees is, whoa, Elizabeth, what? And then Hans Zimmer's score starts playing behind. But Morphs, what? Oh, what? this is like a 1940s Rogers and Hammerstein ballad? And Will starts singing his love for Elizabeth. How he's so amazed to see her for the first time. And it was like, Will, what are you doing? What are you singing? And he doesn't know. Cut to Davy Jones looking for Will and Jack and Elizabeth and whoever else he's looking at for this moment. He's mad and he starts singing. What? Everyone's singing. There's a new curse. The curse of the music box has been placed on Will and Davy Jones. And so throughout the film, they will sporadically burst into song. Again, Hans Zimmer did the score. Let's reunite him with the songwriters of Lion King, Elton John. So Elton John will do the songs for this film. Thus, creating the second, uh, the, really the final act of this film is much more musical, especially when he's on top of the wheel fighting the Commodore and it turns into a tap number. Mm. And so with my changes, the film will garner the musical theater fans who have been going to the film recently now that Chicago and Moulin Rouge are these gigantic hits, gigantic hits. And so now they want to watch more films. And so now that you have that audience at World's End will make a billion dollars. Um, On Stranger Tides may make more money, et cetera, et cetera. That's improving the film. I, I thought of an element you can add. Go, go. We're always open for suggestions. With the... Uh... Since the Kraken is inherently tied to Davy Jones, mm -hmm. the way he cr the way the Kraken crushes a ship, it also sounds like musical keys. It's an accordion. <laughs> it crushes. Also, the Kraken has a voice. It's the dude who plays Audrey Two in Little Shop of Horrors. The mean hmm. green mother from outer space is now a mean red mother from under the water. Hey, Gore. Send us an email, please. All right. Juan, how will you improve this? All right. I actually got an idea when you brought up the organ. <laughs> okay. Because this movie revolves around organs, right? Sure. There's the pipe organ, and then there's the organ that's his heart. Mm -hmm. What if you made them the same thing? Wait. So he's <laughs> looking for his heart. His heart was with him the whole time. Literally, once they open up the chest, they just see a miniature version of that pipe organ that's in his room. And like, as the savvy viewer, you're like, "Ah, I've seen that before." But like, Jack Sparrow's like, "What the hell is this? This is no heart." But then he tries playing the keys, and it plays on that piano over there. Whoa! More magic. Okay, okay. Wait, so is, that, is that your pitch or is that another element to my pitch? That's one pitch I gave right now. Well, you have my, two pitches. My pitch is just a bunch of disparate elements that work together to make this film better. Go on, go on. Okay. Let me pull up my notepad. So are these your notes for the team making the movie? Like if you were the studio head, these are the notes you give to improve yeah, the movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So like... We talked about the dice game for a little bit. Mm -mm. So me, as a fan, I very much enjoy watching people play card and dice video games. Sure. V board games. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> While uh, watching a film. So okay. I, I would like more of those scenes. I felt like the dice game was explained thoroughly and underutilized. Sure, sure. Speaking of ex over explaining things, I'd cut 
I'd cut uh, some of those explanations to have that bring Barbosa back a little earlier because you oh, know no. he's he's fun, and also uh, you know this movie is for children. I feel I I've I'm I like I that this is the one thing we don't agree on. You think yes. it's made for children? I don't. But go on. And as a movie for children, how are you not going to have a big dance number at the end? Wow. <laughs> Uh, maybe a song like Everybody Dance Now. Of course, it's the classic favorite for that sort of scene because it gets the, it gives across the whole point just in the title. It, it, can't, it ha can't be an original song. That okay. one has to be a pop song that's very well known. Hmm. And then it's just all the characters dancing along to it. I have multiple questions. May I ask him or do you want to finish your pitch first? And then this element is added throughout the entire movie. I talked about how this feels like a roller coaster, right? Yes. So what I would do is I would add over like over the entire movie, just have like the rail and like the front of a roller coaster cart and like have that superimposed on top like it's a bootleg of it, but that's the actual theatrical cut. Like a weird mystery science theater thing when they're showing up on the bottom. Yes. Except but it's, it's, it's the it's railing the of the roller coaster. Yes. Is there like a, a the, the the head of the person sitting in front of you as well? No, 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 no. no. no okay. You're you're in the front. That's okay. What, you're okay. you're facing the brunt of okay. the roller coaster. May I ask my questions about this dance number? Okay, go ahead. Is it during the credits as a silly uh, fourth wall breaking thing, or is it part of the plot of the film? Uh. I would say as soon as they go back to, uh, I forget her name. Naomi Harris's character? Yes. As soon as they get back to her place, mm -hmm. they're like, you know what? This is a terrible thing that happened to Jack Sparrow. But you know what? He wouldn't want to be remembered in a tragic way. We need to celebrate. Are and they then cue everybody dance now. <laughs> So the ending of Jojo Rabbit, kind of. Are they <laughs> singing the song as well, or are they just dancing along to it? Uh, I'd say it starts a cappella, and then it swaps over to being fully the song, and no one's singing. They're all just dancing along to it. That's brilliant. That's a brilliant sequence. Is it just them in the hut, or are we also cutting to like Jonathan Price and the Commodore? Yeah. yeah, they're having fun too, but somewhere else. They hear the beat and they feel it in their bones. <laughs> and keep in mind, while all this is happening, the uh, roller coaster cart thing is still there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You're really just changing the, the landscape of cinema with your I mean, to be fair, when... If if we're talking about actually fixing this movie, I'd just not. Like, just skip this one. But, like, if we're going to present this the best way possible, this is what I would do. Wait, so to f if you had the choice, you just erase the film from history? <laughs> I mean, it's not contributing anything even to its own franchise, so it's fine. Yeah, the highest grossing film in the franchise. Let's erase it. <laughs> The peak of the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise. Who cares? But I feel like with these improvements, it would make it the best film in the franchise. The best film in the franchise? What about of the films that have crossed the billion dollar mark? Now we're getting into territory where it's not up to me. It's not up to you? This week it's not up to you? Because we're getting into objective facts. Yeah, we, this entire time, we've been talking about our subjective opinions, but now is the point where we return to the numbers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We go to the experts. We, we return to the numbers. We start and end with the numbers, if you remember. We start mm -hmm. and end with the numbers. So we're getting back to the numbers with the purely objective rankings of these films. I'm going to share my screen, and we'll look at the rankings that we currently have. Juan, would you like to uh, recap the list for our so, we currently have Titanic at number 19 mm -hmm. and uh, 
Return of the King at number three. Really? It's a tough one to beat. So now, Masensen, I have one question for you. Whoa, I like questions. Did you like this movie more than Titanic? I did not. I did not. I did not like this more than Titanic. And just for the sake of keeping everything square, did you like this movie more than Return of the King? I did not. I did not. Okay. You know, I... <laughs> I'll be honest, there's a part of me that wanted to say yes to Titanic so that just strategically it won't be too low because I did enjoy this movie. But uh, if I'm going to be honest, I did not like it better than either of those films. Okay, so what numbers are we working with? All right, so let me just Between 20 and 47. 47, Yes, so we're going to go... What is the name of this machine? Uh, This is the uh, objective ranking calculator yes the objective ranking calculator this week uh we're gonna insert the min of 20 the max of 47 oh wait i thought uh pick a number what isn't that how we did it no 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 it's it's this is the the placement that's for the first one that's titanic oh okay but because it's yes. because we have movies on the list we're gonna compare it to the other movies so titanic is currently 19 replacing it under so it's going to be somewhere between the 20 and 47 mark. One. So, so far we've given our subjective opinions, including figuring out, seeing what, trying to figure out exactly where it might be. And our subjective opinion got us so far as to the placement between 20 and 47. Now we let the objective fates decide. And what is it? It is 37. Number 37. The 37th greatest film to ever cross the billion dollar mark. Pirates of the... Let's see if I spell Caribbean correctly. (laughs) I don't think I did. Dead man's chest. You know, I'm enjoying these uh, objective rankings so far because no one can get mad at them, first of all, because this is proven through science. So to recap our list, at number 37, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. At number 19, Titanic. And number three, Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. King, 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 King. And what I, another thing I like about how it's going so far is we got a nice spread. Oh, yes, we got a nice spread. We I was afraid nice we were going to be a little too too high on a lot of these, but uh, with with this at 37, where we have a, a wider net to cast. Yeah, so there's a lot of spaces where the uh, numbers could be filled in organically without having to be moved up because, you know, something's in the way. Yes, yes. So that was the ranking for that film. Juan, uh, one question. Dead Man's Chest, is this in regards to the chest that the heart is in or Davy Jones's chest, which is missing the heart? You know, this ties back into the organ mm. debate. Mm. Well, not debate. Uh, thematic <laughs> tool. Did you just call me a, th- a tool? Did you call me a thematic tool? You know what? Yes. Now I I didn't before, but I did now. <laughs> You're a thematic tool. How can you live with that? I mean, I'm going to sleep fine. How are you going to live hey, with knowing that you're a thematic tool? Jack thought he was going to live with it, and then he turned around, all right? And then he kissed Kira Knightley, and she handcuffed him. And then he was spit on by a squid that I think ate him. Right, I'll be him? honest, when you said Jack just now, I, I thought back to Titanic because... Yeah, it felt weird. It felt really weird. Because it's Johnny Depp. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't... I can't picture any other name to that character. It's just Johnny Depp. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's about wraps it up for this week's episode on Dead Man's Chest. Uh, tune in next week where we discuss Christopher Nolan's 2008 arguably a modern classic, whether it be like it or not, modern classic, The Dark Knight. Um, Sadly, not streaming anywhere. Not even HBO Max. 
but it just so happens that we both have the DVD. Yes, I also. That's also another movie from my grandfather's collection that I, I have. So uh, I'm assuming most of you have seen this film just because it's a popular film, but you could rent it on like an Amazon or an I- iTunes or something or YouTube if you would like. And uh, join us next week for that. So thank you for joining us on this week's installment of the Billion Dollar Movie Club. Remember to subscribe on your favorite podcast services or on YouTube if you enjoy looking at our wonderful faces. Our beautiful, beautiful faces. Beautiful faces. Oh, while you're there, why don't you leave a comment or review? Who had the best punch-up for the movie? Who do you think the studio should finance while the others should chop off their head and turn to a hermit crab? And also, feel free to like place bets on the objective rankings. Oh, yeah. What number do you think Dark Knight will land at? I have a feeling I know where it might be. I feel like I have I I know our thoughts, but we'll dive deeper into it as we discuss. So thank you. The Dark Knight. Thank you for joining us thank for you. the Dark Knight. Juan, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Uh, I just remembered an entire tangent that I didn't get into. <laughs> do you want to save that for the post show? <laughs> sure. And then maybe we'll be a, a post credit scene. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Oh, uh, well, with that, my compass works! <laughs> what, what I hate Johnny Depp as an actor. <laughs> <laughs>